She just wants to redo the trim in her house. I have to take that job, you know, I can't say no to money. But at the end of the day, you learn that hard lesson where, yeah, you might be taking that small job just because you need money, but who knows if the next day, if you just spent that one whole day marketing online or doing something else to market your business to the right client, that you could have landed a $100,000 project, but instead you're sitting there nailing trim new baseboard. Welcome to episode 140 of the AFT Construction Podcast. And today we have Shannon and Chris from That Tile Chick. And Chris and Shannon have done an amazing job with their social media. Shannon, of course, is the face of it. She's out there uh, in front of the camera. And their story is amazing. They relocated from New Jersey. And I had the opportunity to meet with them personally when we were in Vegas at uh, the covering show and, and built a friendship there. And their business model is just incredible because they've, they've grown this business and there was a pivotal point as most of us have that tipping point where they were frustrated, having a hard time in the construction business. In fact, Shannon wasn't even doing construction. She was in accounting. And now they start that tile chick. They, you know, years of hard work, growing their business, finding opportunities outside of their business, just amazing information, great content, great profile. Again, go follow them to see all the amazing videos that they're doing and super informative. So without further ado, let's get started. This past May, we had an amazing Contractor Coalition Summit. This was in Nashville with Nick Schiffer from Menace Builders and Morgan Molitor from Construction to Style out of Minnesota. And we are now up for our second round of the Contractor Coalition Summit that'll be in Huntington Beach from Sunday, November 6th through Wednesday, November 9th. Go to ContractorCoalitionSummit.com, sign up, register. We have some amazing partners that'll be there sponsoring the event amazing attendees that have already signed up. It's limited seating. We're only allowing 30 to attend. And again, this will be all things pricing, profitability, contracting, client expectations, scheduling, and of course, marketing and social media. Everything that we wish we knew in our business from the very beginning is all going to be wrapped up into just a couple of days. So we'll see you there in Huntington the Beach in November. So welcome to the AFT Construction Podcast. And we have the dynamic duo from that tile chick. Welcome, Shannon. Welcome, Chris. Hi, thanks What's for up, having guys? us. What's up, guys? Thanks for having us. Yeah, so we have Sh- Shannon Yotis and Chris Ortega with us. And we I was fortunate to meet you both. Of course, I've been a big fan for a long time through social media. And it's always different when you get to meet in person. We got to meet each other at coverings and hang out for a few days with Danny Wang. And you know, it's always those trips where you kind of get to know each other on a much deeper level. Where it, Not that it's not great through social media, but you meet in person is so much different. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That human-to-human interaction is just... Nothing can replace it. Yeah. No Zoom call, no, no FaceTime. <laughs> and, and we'll dive into this, you know, not, not just your marketing strategy, but what I love about your content, like, you, you know, you deliver your content in a way where it feels like we already know you, there's a personality behind it. You know, I don't even know if you have this crazy strategy, but the reality is you do such a good job with video and it's like, this is where, you know, the market's going is video, video, video. And I don't think there's any two that capture better than YouTube. But before we get into that, you know, where did this start? You know, that tile chick, that name. I mean, it kind of goes without saying, Shannon, because you're behind it. But, you know, kind of where did, where did this come from? We started a general contracting business in 2017. And at the time, I was still an accountant. And it was always our plan for me to leave being an accountant and come work for our business full time. Originally, I wasn't going to be doing tile. It was just I was going to be helping in some capacity. Um, We weren't able to make that happen until 2020. But lo and behold, we during that time, we decided to kind of scale back from doing big projects and stick to tile. And it was because we kept finding problem after problem with shower installs in our area. It just every client we came across, it was like, well, my shower failed, it was leaking, or I hired this contractor, they never showed up, et cetera, et cetera, problem after problem. And it was like, we kind of saw a little niche in the market to just scale and focus on bathroom and tile and just kind of just service that niche really well. And in 2020, we were able to have me leave my full-time job. And I was like, you know what? I want to set tile. I want to actually do the work. But that tile chick was started prior to you leaving the job. 
Yeah, well, because there's a there's a little bit more of a background story that probably would take up this entire time. But um, we want to, you know, for a long term, we want to invest in real estate and our house that we're in currently, we were renovating it. So I did a lot of projects and I just filmed them and I would post them online. And he was like, why don't you just start your own page? And I'm like, all right. So it was just kind of for fun. And then when I left my job, it was to share my journey. And then it just rapidly grew into what it is. Yeah. She started her page May of 2020 with zero followers, you know, zero. Mm -hmm. And by, I want to say like November, you were at like what? 40 grand, 40,000. Yeah. 30. Like we have screenshots, you know, like <laughs> yeah. every time we hit a mile marker. Yeah. So this is new. I mean, so this is the last couple of years that you've really started that tile chick, the, the social media page. Yeah. Yeah, the growth has just been like, I'm like me personally. I've never seen a page unless somebody like go like super viral. I've yeah. never seen a page grow at the rate that hers has grown. No, because I've been at it for like seven years, and I've and and I think you're ahead of me. So, <laughs> granted, we put in a lot of work towards social media and marketing and all of that. Like it, it takes up a lot of our time. We do a lot of social media and, you know, we might not be turning around as many projects as some other people, you know, because social media turned into being a big part of our business. So we take a little bit more time, pay a little bit more attention to detail, and it's just Chris and I. So we're managing the projects and also doing the social media piece. So we're really feeling that pain this year. This year is really kind of it's kind of becoming a, a turning point where we might need to hire some people. Yeah. And I want to get into, you know, maybe the hiring potentially and uh, as your business has grown through social media, but going back to it, I mean, because when we were together in Vegas, your story was fascinating. I know we talked about the first night at dinner. And so, you know, to, to preface this a little bit, Shannon, what was your background before saying, okay, I'm going to hang it up and I'm, I'm going to go all in with tile and in, in the construction industry? So my, so really background is my dad is a stone mason. So he's been in construction my whole life and my dad doesn't have any sons. If my dad was doing projects on the house, I am, I'm one of those people who I need to, I like to be physically moving and I like to do things. Uh, so all the time. <laughs> all the time. I cannot be stopped. <laughs> um, so of course, naturally when my dad would be doing projects or even there's been, or some t summers that I would go to work with him and I'd be like, I'd pride myself on, oh, how big of, you know, how big of a boulder can I pick up? And my dad's like, why are you doing that? <laughs> <laughs> um, and so like, that's my personality. I went to college for accounting and I spent a long time being an accountant. It was like kind of like fighting my personality to sit at a desk and just be there behind a computer the entire time. So it just, so when we bought this house and we were like going to renovate it, I just, you know, started doing my own projects. He was, he would be out working on clients' homes and I'm like, ah, I have no idea what I'm doing or how to use this tool, but here we go. I'm going to do it. And I would film myself doing it. And it's just, I have the background aptitude, you know, to be able to use tools and know what I'm doing to a degree. Uh, so it just kind of started from there and it slowly inched its way towards when I was able to leave my job and go work for him. Essentially, I'm like, no, I want to be, I want to come and I want to set tile. I want to help you with all of that. That's something I really want to do. So were you already in Houston at the time when you were still doing accounting and then doing work on the side? Yeah. So before we left New Jersey, I was an accountant. And then when we came here, the first thing I did was just find a full-time job as an accountant. And um, I stayed there for a little while just because we were just getting started in the business. And yeah, so I spent two more years being an accountant while I was here in Houston. Yeah. So Chris, what was your background then? I mean, if she's working account, do some projects around the house, you know, on the side, I mean, she mentioned you were doing some general contracting. Throughout high school, I, first I worked at a custom cabinet shop. Then I worked th through my, my friend's dad owned a historic GC restoration business. I worked for him through community college. I was a police officer for like nine years, nine and a half years, almost 10 years. And then we both quit our jobs and moved to Houston. I started off in construction and then I became a cop. 
I still did the construction on the side, you know, here and there. So my background was always there. It's just I my main priority was my, you know, my policing job. And, um, you know, she kind of was always in my ear about, like, you know, doing real estate and all this other stuff. And it was just that at that time when we decided to make the change, there was a lot of things going on in the country politically and at a local level that was like, you know what, like, I don't really want to be involved in this anymore. It's just, it's dangerous on so many levels. You know, I don't need like. You're talking about what your time as a cop, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I I said, you know, I, it's bad enough, you know, you go out there every day and, you know, there's a chance that something could happen, but now you have an administration that is also looking to hang you for any wrong thing that you do. So I'm like, you know what? I just want out. Let's, let's go. Like, I'm still young. I was 28, right? 29. Yeah. You're still both young though. But I mean, but this is such a big change, Chris. I mean, having been in the force, you know, you're working as a policeman. Of course, there's a ton of risk associated with that. As you mentioned, political climate's changing a little bit. So now you're coming into construction and I'm, I'm sure it's super easy, right? Making that transition and construction is such an easy industry that, you know, there's no stress at all, right? As you're trying to figure this out, run a business and just deal with the headache. The only thing that translated like from the policing job to construction is being able to communicate effectively and efficiently with my clients. Right. I, I, so I would imagine that helped a lot. Well, well, you mentioned this to me at dinner, if you don't mind me interrupting, that you had talked about and, I, and we've all been there, right? I, I look back at my career, small business owner, I'm starting my company. You know, I, you know, you're wearing all these hats. Like I'm in the field, I'm a superintendent, I'm trying to have client meetings, business development, do marketing, you know, you're trying to do everything and it's just, it's overwhelming, right? Trying to handle all the stuff, getting trades to perform, trades to show up. And there's that turning point where you're like, not really questioning. It's just like, am I going to get there? Am I going to get there? And I know you kind of dealt with that as a GC that you're dealing with trade issues and you know you're having to self perform things and still trying to manage oh, yeah. at the same time. I you know my our hardest thing was finding um quality trades, you know, good subs. Um and I I wasn't looking for perfection. It was more of like just trying to find somebody else who gave a shit. You know, I call it the give a shit factor. Just give a shit about what you're doing and and do your job. And it makes everybody's life easier down the line with, with whatever you're doing, whether you're doing the blown in insulation or you're doing the electrical, you know, or if you're framing the house, just do your job. And as long as you do your job, it makes the next guy be able to do his job. And I couldn't find those guys, you know, maybe because it was, I was, we were new to the area and I was just putting out uh, feelers on, uh, what is that? Indeed. Yeah. And yeah. super recruiter, you know, I, I had people that. from Louisiana, like, oh yeah, I got tools in a truck, I'll come and work. And it's like, man, like, you know, I just started. I I can't make that kind of commitment to a sub. I really don't, I don't have the work yet. I'm trying to build it. Yeah. Right. So it was a struggle, man. It was the transition was tough. And so with that, when you're managing jobs, at this time, Shannon, had you broken off from accounting? Did you actually go assist Chris at any point, you know, as he's working through his general contracting? Sometimes I actually went on the weekends to actually physically work because there's there was times where Chris would just be really unhappy with what was going on and he would be picking up the tools and it was probably a downfall of the entire process because he he says he's a bag of ice but he's also kind of too nice. <laughs> so although he's a bag of ice, he'll just take on the stress, you know. And I think that that was the, the downside to the entire thing was, you know, instead of just telling the guy never to come back when he calls him and asks him for a paint roller, uh, it's like, you know, he was like, oh, I'll just go do it myself, you know, and those kinds of things were the downfall, I think. Yeah. And there was times where, yeah, he would be working the entire weekend and I would come and show up and either try to help the best I can or you know, just help on the back end with paperwork or whatever needed to be done. Yeah. The way that I saw it is either if we ran into an issue or a problem, either I just handle it myself, don't scream at the guys or don't fire them. Because if I fire them, now I'm delayed because I need to find another guy. Mm -hmm. Right. So, and, and that's one of the things, you know, when you're a GC, 
you rely on these guys. You bid, you bid the job at, at what they're bidding, you know, your bid off of their bid and all, you know, you have all your margins and your markup based off of these numbers. And then to fire a sub and try to find a new one mid project, you know, that's a lot of, that's a lot of risk. So my thought was, okay, the guy didn't want to go get a paint roller. I'll just go get the friggin' paint roller and, and deal with it, you know, so just so I could keep things moving. That was my thought process. Well, and, and you're on the, on the right track. I'll, you know, I was just at a summit this past weekend in Nashville and I share a story. It's, you know, early in my career and to, to your point, Chris, we had, you know, we're only as good as our trade partners, right? And suppliers and, and their performance. And we had a project and it wasn't our fault. You know, our subcontractor made a big gaffe, right? A big mistake. And we're sitting here now and it's kind of that same point that it's like, we're in this predominant community where we want to be. We're building this, this house, right? It's right on the corner, like everyone could see it. And we had to make the decision that, yes, I, there could be litigation. There could be penalty for you know, making changes and performance that we could have went after. But at the end of the day, it's our reputation. It's our timeline, our commitment to the client and the project. And you know, we kind of looked at it like you did, Chris, and it's like, you know, I may have to fire them and bring someone else, but then you have the lost cause, you have litigation. I mean, it just opens up this whole scale. And we chose for, to, chose to hey, we're going to eat this, we're going to move forward because the betterment of the company and the clients and the project and our reputation, let's just get it done. And those are hard decisions to make. But as a contract, as you know, it's like if they're not performing and you've committed to them, you know, there has to be, you know, a little patience, if you will. You, you know, you just may not hire them on the next round. And so from the tile side, I mean, so what, and you mentioned this, Shannon, before I guess, you know, getting into that tile chick, but you had talked about that there were tile issues. I mean, specifically, was it, you know, were, were there any factors that you'd see, especially now? Because I know there's a level of quality that you and Chris are doing. You know, what are some of the, some of the issues that you would see common, uh, commonplace there in the tile industry? You got a slab on grade, you or know, plywood. or plywood with your drain. You got a lot of guys, if they're using a, a three-piece clamping ring and a vinyl liner, they're not doing a pre-slope. So the way it works is a pre-slope of dry pack mortar or uh, what, what else do they call it? Are you, doing? you know, it's like a mix of uh, four parts sand to one part cement or five, mm -hmm. depending on what ratio you like. So you need to have your pre-slope, then the liner, and then another layer of mud, on of top. deck mud on top. And so if the, when the water comes through and it hits that pre-slope and the vinyl liner, it goes to the three-piece clamping ring and then can drain out. Here in Houston, the guys are putting the vinyl liner right over the... Unsloped slab. Unsloped, oh, right over the slab or right over the, the plywood and the water gets through and it just sits. Yeah, because essentially what all these newer products are replacing is that vinyl liner. That vinyl liner is the waterproofing. So if... Obviously, we all know like that the deck mud, the mud is not waterproof. You know, the water right. is going to go through it. So if you have the slope at, on the top, then the liner underneath that and the liner sits flat, the water, it doesn't matter if your mud sloped on top of it, the water comes through. And what does it do? Sits on that flat liner. So when you're doing that method, a pre-slope is essential because then what you'll have is, you know, you know, with the slab on grade, like there could be like a little, a little divot, you know, a little bird bath, if you will, just one little spot. And that one little spot is going to cause mold bacteria to grow because it's just going to sit there and it's going to fester and stink. And you'll have like discolored grout and all this weird stuff coming up, growing through your grout joints. Yeah. It's not that the method, that traditional method doesn't work. It works when it's done right. It just needs steps. to be done properly. You know, there's a lot of moving parts to that kind of process. You know, fold, even like folding the corners and folding the liner over the curb and then wrapping it with a, with a wire mesh is an art form. And unfortunately, it's kind of gotten lost within the last 20 years or so. A lot of guys don't know how to do it. Yeah, it's either it's been lost or... Uh I would say that's probably more common, right? You know, that lack of labor, the training that goes down through generation, and then also maybe a lack of detail. I look at it from my side too. I mean, you know, as a builder, everything is slope, right? On the roof. Okay, where's the water going? Especially in a modern architecture design, we got to keep crickets. We got to keep water going away from the house. You know, how's it work on our windows? Keep water, keep water from coming in the garage or in the front door, especially now 
for us, especially in Phoenix, we have indoor outdoor living, these large multi sliders. Okay, what are overhangs? Is everything sloping away? Because as you mentioned, Shannon, is that you're trying to keep these pockets from happening where water is becoming just stable, where it just sits there and it becomes mold that can deteriorate. And, you know, I'll, one little example for us on we have to have recessed windows because the HOA says you need to have window depths. And what will happen is our framer won't have slope. So again, it goes back to he doesn't put slope in. And the lath guy, you know, our stucco guy's like, oh, yeah, I can just build up slope, which never is going to work because, you know, concrete and stucco absorbs that stuff. Like it has to be, the substrate has to be sloped. That way it's done properly. Exactly. The same thing with like anything. If there's a window in the shower, it's the same thing. The ledge needs to be sloped. Um, you know, obviously it's great that now we have the foam board, you can slope the foam board. So we, that's a lot of the times what we do, because obviously it's not been framed, you know, to be sloped. It's framed square or near (laughs) square, hopefully. (laughs) Um, So like we will, we will pitch the foam board and, you know, we'll pitch our waterproofing so that when the water gets down through the grout joints, because it will, and not all tile is created equally, so not all tile is 100% impervious. So water gets through, and it, we want to make sure that when it hits our waterproofing, it falls down where it's supposed to go. Um, the other thing, like Chris said, like not wrapping the curb all the way. So like a lot of a lot of people will make the curbs out of wood, and then they'll tile right to that. And if any water, if they're stapling the uh, the vinyl liner right to the wooden curb, you know. You're just basically asking for... We all know what happens when water meets wood. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) It's a a great marriage, right? Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So I think that we live in a place where anybody can pretty much get a truck, get a bucket, grab grab some water and get some thin stuff from Home Depot and call themselves a tile contractor. Any contractor. The The only licensing you need here, Brad, is from what I know from what I was doing GCing is electrical, HVAC. Plumbing. Plumbing and signs, doing signs like for commercial, like real estate, like commercial properties. Um, you know, like the big Exxon signs and stuff. That's it. Everything else is, you don't even need a GC license. Yeah. So how, how does that, you know, and this varies by market, of course. So here in Arizona, we have ROC, right? Registrar of Contractors. So we get licensed. We have to have our bond and insurance and register at the state. Is that not the, not the case there in Houston and Texas? No. So it's wide open. And, and to your point, that's the issue is that now you're bringing in a lot of people that, hey, I, I'm working for someone. I don't want it. I want to start my own company, you know, and not realizing the complexity with it. And, you know, they tend to let down their guard or move forward because they're trying to hit a certain price or, you know, be in and out. And then now they're cutting back on the quality. And now at the end of the day, that affects the client, right? Who's investing. Oh, yeah. That's, that is the, it's the problem here. It's good and it's bad, right? It's good because there's opportunity, but it's also bad because it's, so I think Houston is very cutthroat. Even in the highest end neighborhoods, to be a contractor here, you really need to know how to market. You need to be able to sell your value, communicate with the client on why, and be able to educate them in certain ways so that they can really have a base understanding of what you're talking about because you know when they're comparing people coming into their homes giving them a price you have to give them a reason to pick you because yeah i'm sure that there's probably so many contractors here and so many of them with all varying prices and abilities and things like that and um that's one of the areas where we try to focus on a lot is obviously our online presence or communicating that value and educating the client so that they just have a slight understanding of, okay, yeah, this is not something that this other person mentioned at all. And that worries me a little bit. So, so, so what was the magic elixir, if you will, that says, okay, Chris is, you know, he's left the, the force, right? He's the general contractor. You relocate from Jersey to Houston and, you know, you, Shannon, you're doing accounting, doing some stuff around the house, helping up Chris. Now it's like, okay, let's scratch the GC side. Let's start a subcontracting business going to tell I mean, kind of what, what, what made that happen? Um, <clears throat> I was tired of managing people, honestly. That's the hardest part about what we do. It's so hard. Not only that, the, so the, like you said, the, like Shannon said, the market here is cutthroat. So for me to make the profit that I wanted to make, I wasn't, I wasn't getting any bids. So 
if I was paying out, you know, and the subs were charging me because I was looking for subs who had that that give a shit fact. And this is specifically in remodel. Yeah, this you know, is specifically not, for remodel. You know, new it's build a, or anything like that. You know, we were doing rehabs, a completely mm-hmm. different ball game. You know, not new construction. So every every job is like, you never know what it what what you're gonna find. Never. What surprise? Yeah. Yeah. Like, mm-hmm. so, um, you know, I was paying most most of my most of my my money on the projects. I would say two thirds of it was going towards labor for for my guys. I didn't have enough crews to run multiple projects. So you know, if I could scale that number and say I'm making only a certain percentage on one job. Well, if I have three or four or five jobs going, okay, now we're talking. But I couldn't find enough crews to to work with that had that give a shit factor where, okay, I'm not making a, money, a lot of money on one, but if I have five, I'm, I'm making some good money. So I'm like, you know what? Forget it. I'll just, I know how to do the work. I know how to do tile. Yeah. It's a very, tile is a very technical um, trade, especially when you're doing showers. And uh, I was like, you know, it's challenging. It's rewarding. I said, let's just scale back and just we'll focus on custom, you know, showers and kitchens. That's it. We'll do, shower, you know, bathrooms and kitchens. Just keep it to that. No more out, outdoor dealing with replacing fascia and, and rotted, you know, doors and, you know. Decks like, over a first floor that was leaking. Yeah, yeah. A second story Second story deck over a first floor living place, you know, where I, you know, you do all this research and all this stuff for the bid and like you call the, you call your reps on the products and they guide you and then you're like, oh no, you're too expensive. I'm like, well, you already have a leak, you know, you're going to hire some other guy for cheaper and it's just going to happen again, you know, and I'm just like, forget it. We'll just do it ourselves. We can, we can charge what we want for the labor. You know, we, we use a day rate. Like we use a day rate. That's it. We know how fast we work. We know how we work. And we know if we go into a bathroom, okay, it's going to take us 16 working days. And we charge it at $1,500 a day. And, and that's it. Mm-hmm. You know, we can take our time. We do it right. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm sure at some point, yeah, they want to kick you out of the house, right? They want to get back in their bathroom, but um, it just kind of works. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, but here's the thing. Usually, they, the clients that we work for, they usually have at least one other spare, at least one other spare bath. Yeah. So we, we try to focus on the higher end market because you know we tell them right off the bat we're not we're going to be your mo- we're probably going to be your most expensive bit. But here's why. So so how do you deliver that? I'm glad you brought that up, Chris, because this is something that most people struggle communicating or send that expectation that it's not like they're just paying you more, Chris and Shannon, because you have a big social media following or because you're famous, right? I mean, that's not the reality of it. It's just kind of to what you're speaking to is just the level of detail and thought and foresight and really the bones of it, not just the actual product, the most of a C, but what's behind that. You know, how do you convey that to the customer? So it's all through, you know, you show up and you communicate, right? And, and basically, well, let me back oh, yeah. up. Before so, we show up. So to your listeners, yeah. If you're not pre-qualifying your, your clients before wasting your time going out to a, to a job site, you need to start pre-qualifying your clients. Yes. So how do you do that? Like, how do you do it for you? Like, what's your vetting process, if you will? So basically, I have a form on my website um, through Jobber. They are like an online, you know, platform. And I like just curated it to what I wanted. I want to know where they are, where they're located. Um, I want to know all the details about the project in their words, you know, what, what do they want done? Um, their estimated measurements, what they think the size of the bathroom is, maybe attach some photos. I always request photos of the space. And then I'll also request um, like inspiration photos from Pinterest because as equally as important as the square foot of the space, it's also important to know what they want done, the material that they're using. This is all the stuff I want to know before I give them a price, before I talk to them, before I go to their house, any of it. Um, because then I'm able to know if they want marble on the second story, I need to know if their subfloor can support it or what I'm going to need to do to prep the floor for all of that. Uh, so photos of the existing space. Um, inspiration photos and then of course I ask very last 
what is their budget expectation or what do they think this we, project we should like cost? we like to to word it in a way that doesn't feel threatening yeah and th it still may feel threatening it what is your does. cost expectation for this project mm -hmm. and you know if and we'll say if you don't know you don't know mm -hmm. here's three articles you know we'll pull something off a of house or hughes or however you pronounce it or whatever you know average cost of a master bathroom model and here's three different articles and they're all around from starting around 10 or 15 grand all the way up to you know above and beyond yeah so that that's the first thing they'll submit the form or they'll send me a message on instagram or, or an whatever, email. all of the different places or they found me on google so they called me so if they fill out that form i'll get the form and then I will, based on all of their answers, I'll give them a rough price. And I give them information as well, like links to any anything that you know I've posted, any content that I've posted so that they can do some research. I'll give them external links to other places so that they can do their own little research. And then, you know, I give them a rough price and I say, you know, if this price range is good for you, then we can schedule a time for me to come out. And when I come out, that's more of a consult on the project. At this point, I already know that I'm going to get the job because more, they- More than likely yeah. going to get the job. We've probably already talked on the phone. They've answered my emails. We've gone back and forth a little bit on the scope of work. And you know they're okay with my price. Most of the times when this happens, I'll send a price and either I'll never hear from them again or when I do hear from them, they're like, nope, that's okay, that's fine. Yep, when can you come to my house? Like, yeah. I, I, I don't care what it is because I want you to do this job. So it's like, yeah, maybe I'll get 10 inquiries, but by doing it this way, I don't, I'm not running around to those 10 houses where... You're wasting time. I have to pull measurements. Once, yeah, and, once you go to the house, Brad, you're, you, you're committed to, to sending out a bid. Yeah. And you know how, depending on what you're doing, you can... You could be, work on a bid for 16 hours, yeah. you know, or eight hours, a full eight hour day. And, you know, right off the bat, boom, you save the time. Yeah. And, and that, you know, and then when we go out there, we don't care. We're spending two hours there with the client going over everything. If they thought about, you know, because at this point when we're there, they have already picked out their tile. They have already gone to whatever tile store that they wanted to purchase their tile from. They have They're, an idea what they want to use they if idea. they haven't picked it out already. They know what, if they want herringbone or 50-50, whatever. So now we can get eyes on the, on the place. And the only unknown factors is if we pull up the subfloor, like what happened on this job, where we needed to beef it up. Like That's the only unknown factor. And all of that stuff comes because we've been able to scale down and like really hone in on that niche. So we really know and like we can tell the client up front, like this is the only unknown, you know, and unless it takes us three extra days to do it, you know, it's really not going to change the price at all. Yeah. You know, we have not had to significantly increase, you know, a price for a job ever, ever, ever. You know, so when we go out to do that console, we're taking notes, we're taking pictures, we're double downing on our measurements, we're making sure everything is to the tape and we want to give the client the most accurate quote that we can for those of you that have listened to the podcast you know how big of a fan we are build a trend and that we have used this software for the last four years and many of the guests we've brought on the podcast are also build a trend users and in this day and age with as busy as all of us are in construction as complicated as it is with escalation pricing lead times tracking organization all of us need a good project management software to help simplify and organize our business. And there are a couple of features that we love a ton about build -A trend And one is the owner portal. The other is the daily logs. And these are features that we use daily, right? Half of my clients are out of state. And as an owner, it is so imperative how we communicate with our clients, with our team, with our customers. And through build -A trend this allows us that quick connection. They can check at any time. We can communicate with them. We're up to date. This has actually helped us win jobs, win projects because of that organization, especially at pre-construction. And Build a Trend also offers a ton of service on the back end, training and understanding and workshops, you know, to help us use our software effectively. They also have the podcast, The Building Code. To learn more, head to buildertrend.com backslash AFT to get a 60-day money-back guarantee on your Build a Trend account. That's 60 days to make sure you love this product with no pressure, and I know you will.
This episode is brought to you by Pella Windows. When it comes to building homes at AFT, almost every project has Pella Windows. And they've been just an incredible partner of ours. And locally, Sammy and Adam, they are not only amazing business partners behind us, but they are super close friends. And I speak on the podcast all the time about the importance of relationships, right? Relationships with our customers, with our vendors, with our suppliers, because at the end of the day, I'm only as good as those that help our brand and assist us in our projects to to take it from the ground up all the way to completion. And if we didn't have partners such as Pella, there's no way we'd be who we are today. Over the years, we've built this amazing relationship. When we call them or email them, they respond. They're quick. Their they're company culture, their integrity, their honesty, you know, they are always there to do what's right for us and the customer. They can do anything from small replacement projects to large custom homes and even multi-million dollar commercial projects. And also, when you think about their product line, they can do ultra contemporary, historical preservation, and large traditional projects. So for anyone, any scale, any size, they're the ones to call. They're here local. You know, they have an amazing Instagram. Make sure and give them a follow to see what they're doing. So if you need windows and doors, give Sammy and Adam a call. We stand behind Pella. We love what they do, their culture, their brand, and especially their quality. And if you want to learn more about Pella Windows, check our show notes. We'll have everything tagged there so you can give them a follow and have their contact information to reach out. I love that because the biggest struggle I think most contractors have, and especially in the networking I've been in, right? You shouldn't be giving bids for free. I mean, there's a ton of cost in there. And especially if you're bidding right, there's so much that goes into bidding set them properly and there, you know, there's compensation there at least. But and, and so you have to find a way to vet the client or communicate that in a very professional way. And I like how you do it where, you know, the client essentially is is putting that information and allows you a way to analyze it so that you either get um I, I know some small remodels will charge per visit, but even better than that is actually not even get to that point where you're vetting the client, you know, through a quick check like you're doing. And I know Chris, you made this point that early in my career and you too, Shannon, is that there were times someone would call me, oh, yes, I got a phone call. I need to go meet them. Without even asking these questions, and then you get out there, you're looking at the scope of the project, and you're telling the client to guess them, and it's like not even close, and you just wasted all this time. Yeah. And it's just it's so demoralizing for both parties. <laughs> it's, it's really bad. Yeah. And like not only that, it, as a small business owner, if you're, re, you know, you went in and you just, you're just starting out, you're wasting so much time and energy going out to every single house where you could take that energy and be using it into marketing your business online, like through free resources that we're you know, so fortunate to have today. Instead, spend that time more wisely because I will be honest with you, like when Chris started out, the... He, you know, he too was on the bandwagon of just going out to every client because he was getting a call. And I did. He was like, I have to take this job. She just wants to redo the trim in her house. I have to take that job. You know, I can't say no to money. Um, but at the end of the day, you learn that hard lesson where, yeah, you might be taking that small job just because you need money. But who knows if the next day, if you just spent that one whole day marketing online or doing something else to market your business to the right client that you could have landed a hundred thousand dollar project, but instead you're sitting there nailing trim new baseboard to someone. Yeah. It's that opportunity cost, as you mentioned, Shannon. Correct. So it's like, we were both kind of like on that bandwagon to begin with. And I think Chris wanted to make the switch very rapidly. And I think once he tried to pull away and make that switch, I'm like, you can't say no to these clients. Like what? You know? And then it wasn't until we realized how much that actually works that's you'd rather sit home and not take the wrong client and f- put your energy into something else rather than going out and just wasting your time. Yeah. <laughs> it's like once, once it works, once you realize the power of it. Well, it's such valuable insight because yeah. And, and, and maybe you could speak to this from the social media side is that so many times as you network, and I'm sure you get the same thing as you network with maybe fellow tile contractors or builders for me or, or, or suppliers to that point. Oh, how do you have time to post to social media? I don't have time for that, you know. And as you mentioned, it's just it's realignment, right? We all manage our time differently, and there's certain things where you see the value in social media and what that's done for your business, not just as related to that towel chick and your immediate customer base, but also how that's opened up your network and relationship with vendors and suppliers outside of that. Yeah, I, I we're right now in a growing pain phase. Right now, in this instant, we are feeling that same resistance, if you will, where we're on a job physically working, but we have all this other stuff. And 
yes, we have done a really great job up to this point allotting our time where we think it's beneficial. But I think that it's come to a point where we really need to start getting some people on board. I don't know if we're going to need another hand setting tile, somebody else to help us on the back end in the office, at least, at, at the very least. And, um, you know, it kind of makes us afraid as we go into this next transition because that's the whole reason we got away from the GC side of things is because of the managing people. Managing people. Yeah. But at the end of the day, if you run a business, you're going to, if you want to scale or if you want to grow, better, you're yeah. going to have to manage people. That's what it's all about, you know? And I, I managed, I was a cop. I managed people. That's what I did. You know, you show up to a domestic violence scene and there's, you know, cousins and aunts and uncles all fighting. You got to manage those people. You just need to, the way I used to manage is, you're good Probably at not ex problems. acceptable in a professional environment. <laughs> in the construction side. You yeah. know what I mean? So, yeah. you know. I also think it was, we were very alone. Yeah, it was a new... very beginning period of our business. We've It's been five years now. I've only been here for two full time. So, you know. Yeah, but I'm, you, were always, you were always here in the background, always. But how know. much better is it just to have one other person full time? Right. Well, that's what I said. If I could just find one person just to, mm -hmm. to help. And I used to tell, she, you know, I would tell her, oh, this is what, what I did today. And she's like, oh, that's it. And I'm like, I, I'm only one person. I can only mix one bag of thin set at a time. Mm -hmm. I can only pick up one tool and bring it over here at a time. I didn't, there's, that's it. You know, mm -hmm. if I'm working by myself. Yeah. You know? And answering phone calls, emails, yeah. whatever, like. Yeah, and but to your point, I mean, you were one person at the time, Chris, but as you and Shannon dove into this and you started documenting and doing all the video content, what made you think to really document as well as you've done, you know, to say, let's let's create video, let's edit this. And I know that's been enhanced and gotten better, I'm sure, especially from your first video to now. But but why why did you start? Why did you think of starting a page and how has that just changed your business? Here's what happened. <laughs> when she used to come to work with me like on the weekends or whatever, if she had a day off, like, you know, you new business, you're working the holidays. She's off. Yep. She would come to work. I would snap a photo or take a video. And on my construction, on my construction, in, you know, Instagram, I used to get like five times the amount of likes. So <laughs> I'm like, what the heck, man? I also used to do crazy things like use the grinder with no shoes on. Yeah. This was like before... When you don't work with a tool every day and you just pick it up just to use it to get whatever it is you need done, and it's like you don't realize the dangers you're putting yourself in. Right. I used to do crazy things like that. Now I'm terrified of the grinder. Uh, it's like my most feared tool. But okay, swerve, sorry, swerve. that was my swerve. So I'm ADD like, brain. I'm like, if you're gonna be doing tile with me, I'm like, you need to start your own page. Like, you need to start your own page. Like, there's no tile chicks out there. Like, you know what I mean? Right. You don't see it. it, you know, it's not that, that it, you know, I'm not trying to say that it, she does well because she's pretty. It's just, you just don't see it every day. You don't see a chick doing construction. You know, I, I wasn't like following, like I now, I know, I now know there's a lot of girls out there doing it, Yeah. but you know, at the time I didn't know there was anybody specifically really like prominent in the tile industry. So I'm like, if we're going to be doing tile, I'm like, just call yourself that tile chick. She was like, no, it's dumb. I was like, Ugh, I hate that name. Maybe we'll change it yeah. later. So really, yeah. I can't do that now. Yeah. Now it's stuck. Um, but yeah. And then pretty much once we started realizing that people like they engaged with my posts and they liked, I'm like, we need to do better at this or do better at this or post more. And, you know, it just evolved very, sl very, not slowly because it was very rapidly really, yeah. but like we just, as people had more interest, we kind of just leaned into towards like what they had interest in and what performed well. And then we like would test new things here and there and see how that did. Um, you know, he he used to just edit and film everything right from the, he had like the iPhone 10, you know, right from the iPhone 10. Yeah. And he was like editing iPhone. everything on there. And then it really wasn't until just a couple of months ago that we put money towards purchasing a better camera you know, for, I held for out the for the longest time. Long I was I like, could. we need a better camera. Like we need to upgrade our phones. We need to do this. Mm -hmm. We need to do that. And she's like, no, not yet. 
no, not yet. No, yeah. not yet. I'm like, but it's a tool. It's an yeah. investment. It's going to make money. So, yeah. And not only the investment on the equipment, but also the investment in the time on the page. Yes, the content does it does well. I'm sure that it helps. I'm a female. But at the end of the day, we in the beginning of the when we created the page and we started seeing it get some traction, we spent hours and hours at night on the couch answering messages, engagement. engaging until Instagram would literally block us from engaging on other people's posts. Yes. So Act, like, they call it action block. Action right. block. That's happened to me early on, too. Yeah. So like, and I think that that's common. I've heard a lot of people who now have big pages. That was something that they started off doing and just following, you know, searching through the hashtags of tile or design or whatever niche you're in. Oh, easy there. Following. He doesn't want me to give away all his secrets. So we, we always, we, you know, we try to help people as much as we can. Like if they come to us and they're like, Hey, how did you grow your page? Hey, you know, try doing this, 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 and this. So we've been talking and I think we want to make a course um, for social media, you know, for businesses, for businesses, to give them tactics, like actionable tactics that they can do to be able to help grow their page in a way that will be organic so they can have better organic reach instead of just always relying on paid ads and what's that infographics. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, the the point of this, I think you bring up a good point because a lot of people are like, well, you know, I'm starting my page, I'm I'm doing content, but I don't have the latest and greatest, whether it be from technology or camera. Mm-hmm. And to your point, Chris, I mean, you're here you are doing using an iPhone 10, you know, forever, you know, building this page so you have tremendous success and then you could advance to the next level, right? So it's still progression, but you can still build a following and you know, you don't have to have this super high end photography, although it's mm-hmm. great to enhance your business, but I mean, you've, you've really seized this through, through videography. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, our core thing, like, so as her page grew and, you know, she went from zero to 10,000 followers in like two months, right? Maybe it was, it was, it was a short time. It was I don't fast. know if it was two months. He's I started doing, little... I started researching and like, like I'm a tech nerd. So social media marketing, social media influencer marketing and, and just really like diving into it and learning tactics and strategies and coming up with our own stuff, like Shannon said. And it got to the point where I'm like, you know, this could be not only like working with brands and, and getting paid to post branded content, you know, ads or whatever is great is awesome. But you're building this following that eventually, you know, you build this trust and rapport with your audience and, you know, you, you could sell them this freaking notebook and, and they're going to buy it just because of the trust and the rapport and, and that connection they have with you because of who you are. Mm-hmm. And our biggest thing was just, just like, just be ourselves, educate, provide value and entertain. Yeah. It, it pretty, like that's the. It, it seems easy, but the reality is, I mean, there's a couple things that you mentioned is that. It, you know, providing value, right? So if there's value add, whether it be from potential clients, your network, suppliers, vendors, you know, if you're providing value, that's going to attract people, right? And then to entertain, I mean, that's, the, you know, that's huge too, because there's a reason they want to go and watch that video. And, and really, even if you're trying to beat some analytic game, it all comes down to one thing. If you're engaging as you both are with your audience and you're reciprocating that and people want to watch, Every metric of any platform is tracking how long people are watching that. And if you're entertaining and they're watching that and they love it, it's going to help your analytics no matter what. Oh, yeah. Like, I feel like now more than ever, people are looking to engage with like real people. You know, you're, we're seeing more raw content do really well online with the short form videos and things like that. Um, and it's just, you're not seeing this high end, like, we try to keep our edits very basic because we, we also know that because of the introduction of TikTok, it has brought in that more organic, raw feel into the content and people are resonating with that tremendously. We can see that on almost all platforms that they've now released the real feature in any in all different capacities. Facebook real, Instagram yeah. real, YouTube, YouTube shorts, shorts, TikTok. You know. Yeah. It's I'm like, sure there's something else I'm missing. And 
And if you're if you're looking to build a brand and and sell anything to anybody or just build a brand, social media is a free tool and a vehicle that you can use to grow. Like if you think of a sales funnel, it's the top part of your sales funnel. All these people fall in and they'll trickle down and it's so huge and so important because it's free to you as a business owner. So it should be a place where you're spending your time. And I know that not everybody wants to have this huge following, but if you want to have a huge following, it takes a lot of time investment up front. You will not get paid for a cent of anything that you do for a very long time. And but it's worth it in the end because now you've created this vehicle that just grows and grows and grows and grows as you grow. And the opportunity that's there is almost endless, really. You know, unless you commit a humongous crime that ends up in the world news and now you are just, you lost all your all credibility, um, then your opportunity is endless. You can take that vehicle, you can sell a product, you can create a product, you know, you can do all different types of things with partnerships and deals and Obviously, if like you're you're trying to market to a specific audience, like it's very targeted, it's very niche specific. Everybody has a niche and, you know, any page on social media has a niche, you know, so you're literally even if you only have 1000 followers, that's 1000 followers who are interested in your business that you can market to. And I think it's like a really important thing that not a lot of people focus on. And I hear a lot of people, "Ah, social media is the devil. Well, if you own a business, it's a free marketing tool and it's not the devil. Yeah. If you use it the right way. Yeah, using it as a tool, not a place to waste your time. Right. So how is that how's it change your business? I mean, you probably didn't anticipate at the time you started it that it would become this viral machine that it has on all these platforms. And so now you've had this tremendous success without even knowing it'd be that way. But how has that changed not just maybe the caliber of client, the scope of work you're doing now, education, but also that vendor and community relationship we quickly realized um you know that we needed to start treating the social media you know that tile chick brand as a separate business um we had some help i guess yeah just with through, some like, talking to different people some bigger online. people on social media so yeah. you know and that's who who gave us all this advice because we didn't know any of it a lot of it we had to learn ourselves. but some things we were given little tidbits like hey you know make sure you're doing this and make sure you're doing this um and we quickly well if i interrupt you chris what's interesting that's a network side i think one of the benefits of social media i've spoken this about this you know when i'm on some formats is that it's not just the relationship with the vendors and the clients but you can work with your peers i could say hey chris shannon what are you guys doing like are you working with this vendor and, and just the strategy behind just those relationships? Yeah. And, um, you know, it, it quickly made us realize like we need to treat this as a business and all the time and everything we've put into it is an investment. So, you know, if you have a following and you have a brand reach out to you and they want you to post their stuff, you should be compensated for it fairly because, just Google how much does it cost to make a you know to hire a, a guy to create a a YouTube video. The average is like a thousand dollars a minute. You know, so you have an audience and you have the equipment and you have the skills to edit this video and create this video. You should be getting and paid. And you're marketing it. Too. And you're marketing it. You should be getting paid as much, if not more, because now you're a very you 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 have a very targeted audience who that brand wants to reach so you are invaluable to them through influencers or creators brands are able to reach an organic audience whereas if you run a paid ad they're reaching yeah that's not an organic audience it's like spraying a machine gun out into the woods trying to hit a deer versus having (laughs) you know a sniper with 15 rounds in the in in the mag and picking off 15 deer you know that's the difference yeah yeah And it has changed our business a lot, not only because we're able to, a lot of our almost, actually, I don't know if there is a client that I've worked on their house that they haven't followed us on social media. Maybe like when I first started, when I very first started, yeah. But now everybody's like, oh yeah, now I already know I follow you already. You know, (laughs) and 
whether or not they say, oh, I found you from social media, but it's like, I will talk a lot about certain things and they're like, oh no, yeah, I know. I already I saw, saw that. that video or yeah, I already know. And I'm like, oh, okay. You know, like they follow me. So it, it gives a different credibility because you've already sold yourself before you got in the door. You know, they already are like, no, I want, I want her to do it, you know, yeah. before I even showed up to the... What do they call it? Online uh, authority? Or yeah. social, That's you know. That's what Google calls it. Online yeah. authority. Yeah. Yeah, but here's the here's the reality of it. If, if if I'm looking at it from the client's perspective, you know there is right, wrong, and different. You know a lot of questionable reputations out in the construction world, right? But if I know, hey, look, Shannon and Chris are out there, they're public. You know, I bring them on now. You know, I know that they they have some skin in the game per se, right? They want to do a good job, and then also you're you're showcasing the thought leadership, as you said, trusted entity, and you know, so I know that my investment. And hey, if the reality is if 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 I feel like I know you, there's a relationship. I mean, yes, I. Everyone works hard for their money, and they know if they invested in that value that you're bringing, you know, it's going to pay off for both parties. So so yeah, so social media has really helped you create the ideal client, as you mentioned, because for you, Shannon, all your projects are with people that follow you. Yeah, exactly. Uh, um, we're not going to like, we're not going to make it seem like we get jobs every week. Mm-hmm. Um, to be honest, we we haven't worked a paid job since November of last year, but. That's because we had people reach out who we pre-qualified. They didn't, they didn't fit. But, you know, we had a couple people reach out over the winter and it did, kind of didn't work out. And then the phones kind of just went dead, mm-hmm. you know, even with Shannon's so social cute. following. So just because you have 140,000 followers on Instagram doesn't mean that you're going to be lining up with work, which, you know, you would think mm-hmm. it would. It, sometimes it's not the case, you know. So, but because of social media, we were okay. And we didn't, it wasn't like, oh my God. We didn't have to foreclose on our house, you know, because we <laughs> <Yeah>. built <laughs> yeah. this other business. Yeah. You know? Like it's yeah. just a completely different, it's just a whole separate entity from what we physically do. You know, all of our physical work is, falls under our Atlantis construction umbrella, but Tile Chick is just the media portion and the brand associated with it. Okay. So, I mean, it is, it really has elevated our our business and our careers. So do you ever find complexity because what's amazing is even the time I spent with you, like you get along so great, you know, you're super outgoing, super fun. I mean, is it ever difficult, you know, being, you know, engaged, working together, business together, kind of incorporating all that? Yeah. Today was one of those days. (laughs) That's a traffic, right? It's a traffic in Houston. Brutally honest. By the time we were leaving, I'm like, I do not want to do a podcast. I do not want to be in the car for another 45 minutes with her. No, that's a joke. I love you. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it was a, today was a tough day. It was, it was tough. And, but at the end of the day, like, you know, I, I said to her, had like 15, 20 minutes into the car ride, we like didn't speak to each other. Not because we were mad at each other. We just, it was just a rough day. The stress of the day. Yeah. yeah we've all had those rough days. Day. Yeah. Like, you don't want to talk. Yeah. You just feel angry. And, uh, you know, I, I grabbed her hand and I said, look, you know, we, it's okay. Like we're going to, we're going to kick ass tomorrow. Don't worry about it. I know you spilled the coffee in my truck. It's not I a big deal. Spill coffee. He took a turn <laughs> and the coffee went flying. I didn't spill anything. I was mad before the coffee <laughs> fell over. Um, so yeah, okay. it, it's tough. It, mm-hmm. it can be tough, but at the end of the day, you know what you need to eat, you need to let it roll. Cause if you don't, if you don't let the bad shit roll off of you, it's going to consume you and you're not going to be able to go any further. Yeah. Um, you won't. You can, you'll do it for a little while, but it'll catch up to you. It will. Yeah, it all comes out on that communication. That's a good point. So what do you guys do for fun outside of you know working on the business, social media, towel, traveling together? I mean, all, all that goes into your business now. What do we do for fun? I think we've kind of learned to like love torturing ourselves we so we do like going to the gym yeah we, we really we, like to do that we go to the gym um, um we <clears> like to i really like to walk my dogs it's like it's just 20 minutes of peace and yeah. i just walk my dogs and it's fun um but you know every once in a while we'll go out with our friends but it's a very rare we do a lot of times have family come to visit like right now my sister's here so you know it's <laughs> When, when our family's here, we try to make time, especially on the weekends, to go out and go do fun things with them. And so, 
Yeah. It's really like what we do for fun. To be completely honest, we love running a business. We love being our like own bosses. We love it's been so crazy the last two years that the the rate of which we have grown, it's tremendous to see and like look back on and it makes you just so much more motivated to wanna, you know, keep, keep going. going and so um balance between our work life and our home life um honestly it's uh it can be hard sometimes because we kind of think backwards um she thinks one way and i think the the other way but we always come to a mutual understanding of how we're going to get something done um but running a business together it's it's hard because we're always so focused on our business and our success and our future that, you know, it, we don't always take the time to um, massage the other side of our relationship, which is the, the uh, you know, the love relationship, our, our, our relationship. What really started our, our partnership was doing things together. Yeah. And, and it's partly my fault. Like I'm always pushing <clears throat> for us to be better and to move further ahead in life. And, um, I don't take enough time to really spend time together doing the fun things that we used to do because we spend so much time working on our business. And that's a, a character flaw of mine, honestly, that, uh, you know, it's something I'm striving to be better now that we are in a little bit better of a situation than we were say five years ago when we started the business. So, um, I need to kind of learn how to let off the gas and um, managing that balance between our work, our work relationship and our personal relationship, you know, can be hard at times. It's definitely hard. It's even hard for me. Like you say, you don't blame yourself, but I do it too. Like I do it all the time. I'm like, Oh, well, let's go. You know, we have to do this or we have to do that. And constantly it's always in the front of your mind. And then you kind of like can bury all that other stuff. You know, and I'm kind of afraid for the day that we have children that I'm, I want to learn how to create that balance now because when you have kids and there's other things that need to be done, it's like you feel like you're sacrificing your business when you when you like make plans for a weekend and you have to cut out of work early on a Friday to go do something with a friend. Like you feel like you're failing your business or you're not going to be successful. You're not going to reach that successful point if you do that. And like we both do that. Like both of us do that. We're very hard on ourselves individually. And then it, you know, it's hard on your relationship when you're working and then living with that person. So it's kind of like you constantly wake up 24 seven and it's work, 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 work. And you start enjoying the process and the journey of the work and the oh, success 100%, that you achieve. hundred percent. But there's other things in life that are equally as important. And sometimes you're kind of working against yourself and you lose productivity when you don't allow yourself that time to enjoy life and enjoy the life you are creating and enjoying the journey. Cause one day you could just wake up and you've missed so much stuff. Yeah. And that's not, I don't well, want that to happen. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. I think, you know, in this episode, you both spoke well about not only how you built your business, but also expanded that where you have additional revenue sources outside of your business, right. That can allow that. And, you know, I had uh, like the best advice I was given, they said, Brad, you know, you, you always hear this word like work-life balance and the reality is like they're like there is no such thing like you just have to find balance and it means different mm -hmm. things to different people because we only have so many cups we can fill and so like however you know there may be some days you're working till eight o'clock every night and that's life and then maybe one day like you said chris you're taking off early on a friday to have that time and you know it's a, it's a tough balance our industry is not very forgiving so it's hard but um along those lines like what do you guys have that's upcoming and, and exciting so um, we have we have another project starting next week, and then after that, we're heading out to Arizona to work with you yeah. <laughs> on the Net Zero property. So I'm yeah, really thank excited. You. We, yeah. we uh, we're grateful that <clears throat> you know we were able to meet in co at coverings and you know kind of make the connection, and uh, you know we appreciate the opportunity you're giving us to go out there and tile one of the bathrooms. So we're really excited about that. Are you kidding me? Is that I'm excited about the opportunity you're giving me to have you guys come out and visit. It's going to be amazing. We, uh, just to preface it, we had, uh, as you both know, Matt Reisinger was out, you know, we did a bunch of video content at the Build Show, and uh, it's the the home of the year, Net Zero House, and we're fortunate to have Chris and Shannon. They're going to be out uh, doing the guest suite for us, so we're 
really pumped about that and a ton of content coming. Mm -hmm. I'm pumped about that. Yeah. So, and, then, and then after that, we, we're probably going to be going to New Jersey to do some projects there. We have a couple of family members that they want to get their bathrooms done and, um, you know. We're at a point in our business where we can do that, right? So like. Yeah. Five years ago, we would have never imagined being able to pack up our tools and go to Arizona to work on a property and like create content and do stuff, do something cool like that because we just wouldn't be able to afford it. No. And, you know, this is the thing that we're, we're just talking about balance. It's like we've achieved this, you know, and we're able to do this. And it's very satisfying and gratifying to know that you put in this work and then it pays off. You know, you're able to meet incredible people and like you're able to collaborate on cool things and travel and, you know, create beautiful things and go all different places. And so, yep. I mean, it's very satisfying. None of that would have been possible without the work you put in yeah. every day um, and, you know, the grind. And you, you know how it is, Brad, building something. It's like, you know, in the beginning, it's hard. And then eventually, I would say, what, this last year and a half? We're starting to see the the rewards of our anguish and pain and suffering. So much struggle. So it becomes addicting, which is why, you know, like we say, like, we don't really hang out with people. We don't do fun things. We, we like, we enjoy working on our business. But like Shannon said, like managing that balance now, it should be a priority because we've come to a point where we can say, hey, you know, we're not going to take on paid client pro projects this summer. We're going to go tile our families bathrooms and go do the net zero house in arizona and instead create cool content but it's only because we put in the work to create those other revenue streams in the beginning to allow us to get to this point now so um we're coming to a new chapter in our business and in our life and you know it's going to be trying to navigate new waters you know hire additional people to help us mm -hmm. you know the you know office space you know we have a lot of stuff coming up this year um we're probably going to be buying another investment property to rehab and create content for and hopefully um, have some compensation coming in from from brand deals and stuff like that and promoting their products while we're renovating our own space you know so it's pretty magical it's pretty crazy you know i call it double dipping because you know you're you're renovating <laughs> you're renovating an asset and you're also getting paid by brands to help promote their products um you know it's like a it's a win-win and um you know we're grateful for where we've we've come from and where we are now. Well, it's amazing what you both have done. I, you know, I can't thank you enough for coming on today on the episode and especially now there's your balance, right? You're turning vacation and work. You got a little, little mix of both there. So, um, especially for them to follow along, not only the net zero, but what you're doing in Jersey and the investment property, where can they find you? Um, they can find us on that tile chick on Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, Facebook, Facebook, um, LinkedIn, <laughs> yeah, any social media platform. Thattilechick.com. I, I am there, and yes, my website, thattilechick.com. And if you have any questions and you want to reach me easier, you can send me an email, thattilechick at gmail.com, because my DMs get flooded. And for all my fans, I'm always here, you know. <laughs> so if you need to reach me, you can reach Shannon. <laughs> Oh, you guys are amazing. I'm so excited to see you again in a few weeks uh, as you come on out to Phoenix. And thanks for making time today for the episode. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us, man. So thank you all for tuning into the podcast today. And just as a recap, if you check the show notes, they're just going to have all the links for the topics that we discuss. And also one of our favorite features now is the chapters that go through the conversation. So if there's certain topics you want to revisit or listen to, they're outlined by the time that we discuss those. And again, we can't thank you enough for all of your support. Please make sure and download our podcast, subscribe, give us a five-star rating and review wherever you download your podcast.